Um, the first speaker is Anirban Bandyu Padhyay. He is working in Japan. He has contributed a lot to our understanding of microtubules and what they do, how they behave, how they are structured. And it's a great pleasure for me to invite you up here, Anirban, and give your talk. Thank you very much. Okay, so today my uh, topic is, uh, can we view brain as a time crystal? So crystal, I think um, most of us, we know what is crystal. Um, if I stand somewhere at this point, say here, and rotate 360 degree, I will have infinite path. I can start walking, and if I find atoms are sitting in an ordered way, then we call the space as crystal. But um, time crystal is a little different. Uh, we do not have any space, so we close our eyes, and we imagine as if we are moving around in time. So if our phase is changing, okay, we imagine that. And if we find at certain positions we can't move, the time almost stops or singularity happens, not once, at least twice, then they call it time crystal. So time crystal, this concept, came in the 1970s or 1960s because people were trying to find out how virus or small elementary life forms, how they become intelligent. Is it that in the 3D space of information structure, there are many, many clocks, and those clocks hold time? And if we make a journey through this um, intricate pattern of time or the geometry of time, we will be able to figure out what the living systems are talking about. Unfortunately, in the 1990s, this field, the research field, disappeared. And 2012, again, Frank Wiljek from MIT, he brought it in, both classical version of time crystal and quantum version of time crystal. So when I am giving the presentation, um, I'm talking it about it generally. So you can consider it as classical or quantum. So the problem is not whether it is classical or quantum. Problem is how we view it in the biological system. So basic questions that people try to answer is how the fundamental unit of information looks like in nature or in our brain to understand consciousness. And suppose multiple life forms are there and they are talking to each other without any programming, without any algorithm. How they manage to converse for hours or continuously throughout their lifetime? So is there any, any mathematical or any protocol? Third question that could be, again, fundamental, which is, can we imagine the simplest device the simplest biological device, um, its engineering, what would be its elementary property, minimum property, so that I can reverse engineer all the complex biological decision-making machines? The simplest one, what could be that? And number four is, is there a universal language? All the living organisms or our brain, the cells, they are talking to each other. Is there, is there a universal language? Can, can we discover it? Can we, can we invent it if, if, if we have to do it in a new way? And um, uh, often we find wonderful things in the biological systems. They don't reject, like the logic gate. You have many, many choices. You reject most of them and you take one. Uh, often we don't do it. For an example, tomorrow is exam. Tonight you decide that you have to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Finally, you drop everything and start um, watching a movie. So, and again, you, while you're watching the movie, you can get back to it and start working. So, living systems follow certain kind of computational protocols which does not fall into the conventional computing category. Can we find that? So, long back in 2014, I will not mention any of the experiments. I will just go through uh, philosophically uh, on every aspect of it. 
So you know that uh, for the last 110, 115 years, we think that uh, universe, whatever be the complexity of the event that is, has happened, is happening, or will happen in the universe, every single complex event could be sequentialized as a sum of simple, simple events or a switch, 0, 1, 0, 1, flipping like that. Then there is a quantum where you have a qubit. 0 and 1 are classical states. Classical means that we can see and infinite states in between. So we suggested that leave apart beta or qubit, take the faith space or the all possible solution, infinite possible solutions that you can think of or you can imagine, but therein, couple of points, couple of solutions you, you cannot acquire. Those are singularity points. Those singularity points, they have a clock with them. So like bing, 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 or tick, 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 then you get a triangle, tick, 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 four times you get a square or something like that. So these are the two fundamental changes we asked. I'm not saying this is the most absolute one and we will be able to explain everything that is happening in the biological system, but this approach helped us to get into the bottom of many mysteries. And uh, if we have three different kind of singularities to explain, say, um, a, a triangle, or a, a, or a square, or a pentagon, or something like that. We say that every single information in the universe is geometric. And by measuring the microtubules, I explained this several times, so I'm not getting into details. So suppose we have three singularities, and we pump the singularity domains, or uh, quantum wells, uh, with noise. Then we can generate pure magnetic ring or uh, electric rings by uh, uh, interference or diffraction pattern. And more you pump the noise, more rings come out. So today, the most important presentation that I will give is an experimental result to demonstrate that these kind of rings truly come out from noise, and they create beautiful pattern or geometric architecture. So uh, magnetic rings are actually the silent mode. So several times in the earlier in TSC, I have given a lecture that um, our information is not in the sound, is it in the geometry of silence, the gap between the sounds. So uh, these B magnetic rings are the interference null, or, or the silence points where you see the darkness, the darkness where the magnetic field or electric field disappears, and these geometric structures could be created. In, uh, it is in the field of optical vortex. If they rotate, you get electric field, and if electrical charge rotates, you can get magnetic fields. So this kind of geometric correlations exist. So what is our information integration then in nature? We can start with a pentagon, and every single corner is the singularity. You have a bing, and you extract another geometric shape. And then again in the corner, bing, and extract geometric shape. And the phase space, or phase spheres, it grows on absorbing more and more spheres in the singularity points. So the total information of the living creature or the living system or biological entity is, is just, it could be just one bit because it's just single architecture. So the amount of resources is not important. So let's look at the video. So suppose uh, you have a phase space and you are holding a geometric shape that is triangle. Then the circle goes like this. And these corner points are the singularity points. It blasts off. It adds another spheres. And then you get new geometric shapes, and it goes on and on and on and on. Remember that these things we didn't imagine. We didn't get by imagination. We measured the protein vibrations. And we found the correlations of vibrations and found how the geometry architecture of information has built up in the biological systems. So when we realized it, um, this kind of spherical presentation of uh, singularity points, we, under we try to understand that, um, is, it, is it true that we can create a language out of it? And we can convert any uh, visual information, auditory information, or any kind of uh, nerve signals into this kind of spherical architecture. If you look at D, you can see a frog. And a frog is converted into this nested spheres. So we did it for everything, the test signal and all kind of nerve signals we could feed and we could uh, form into, a, um, in, into this kind of structure. 
And then we went on looking into different uh, tribals, they were how they are speaking, and um, the sound of the birds and uh, plants. And today we can have we have a demo here, and you can go and check. We will uh, play the vibrations of plant proteins and protein cells by pinning it, and we will see that uh, time crystal-like structures coming out. This is one example. This is a uh, uh, Radha Swami mantra is being played. The sound is not here, but you can see that with the pronunciation of every note, uh, irrespective of language, a universal geometric shapes are played out. So we tried it with many different kind of language of the planet, um, especially tribals, and we saw the similarity between them. So our job is to now find out uh, if we can, uh, if we can, uh, if our uh, language that we have discovered is truly universal. So now we have come to a point to tell what is time crystal. Suppose uh, you have a sphere and the clock is rotating. So you know sinusoidal wave. If you rotate around the, around the circle, you get a sinusoidal wave. Now, if you have another sphere embedded into it, and when you touch the sphere, then a new wave comes out for a certain period of time, and then again, the old wave returns in the middle row. In the bottom row, you see that two spheres are connected together. When two spheres are connected together and two different waveforms you get, then you get two atoms, just like matter. And that is the time crystal. So anywhere, if you want to do experiment, if you get this kind of result, that bottom row, then you can conclude that you have seen a time crystal. So uh, we understand that it is time crystal. Now the next important thing that we have to understand is how these informations are naturally integrated in the system. That's the most important part of it, because information we can even imagine, but, but how, for an example, you are here, you didn't know what are you um, going to listen, and I, I didn't know what I'm going to, going to say. But every moment, what comes to my heart, to my feelings, I'm, 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 went, I'm going on uttering, uttering it. But, but eventually, at the end of the day, you will get something, I will, I will also get something, and a conversation will be done. But no algorithm, nobody wrote any program or anything. How is it happening? So to, to find that out, what we did is, suppose somebody randomly gives me the events, and I am arranging them. Can I do it infinitely? No. It's just like in, uh, when we were kids, we did LCM, HCM to find out combination. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, these are the choices. And if somebody gives me four events, we can do it in a 2 into 2. Uh, for 6, 2 into 3, 3 into 2. This is the way integration happened. And I, I write down at the bottom, what are the maximum number of choices um, um, for any given uh, point, a given number of event, and our solutions. You see that for 12, we get nearly seven or eight choices. And for eight, we get one nested. So if we write in terms of time crystal, it looks like this, two into two into two. Uh, we can write 12, two into three into two, 3 into 2 into 2, or 2 into 2 into 3. Now understand that these three different kind of ways you can arrange the events. So there could be an uncertainty of events. So can we estimate all possible events in the universe like this? So imagine we have a metric, just like astrophysics has a metric, say uh, intelligence or biological system has a hardcore metric, where you give input random events and the metric converts it into a nested circles, nested times. So you get geometric shape, you get um, all the interconnections, so all the intelligence hidden in a system is automatically revealed. So two humans, they, um, both of them having this metric, I, uh, if you look at their metric, they are a little bit different. Some of the points exist here and some of the points doesn't exist over there. When they get similar set of events, they arrange it in a little different way and they can converse and they can exchange the information. So in both the cases, we do not need software algorithm. So we have patented this technology and we have uh, done algorithm and we have, uh, we, have, we have tested that actually you don't need to write uh, the instructions how to do the intelligent decision making. A system can automatically, naturally integrate random events. Now, that is not enough. Because in the universe, event can happen in many different ways. So how many number of events, num, number, how many numbers are there in the universe divided by two? 
50% of the numbers, right? So C2 symmetry, we observe almost 50% cases when the structures are built in the universe. One third symmetry, we, we get nearly 16%. So we calculate it for every single prime, how many, what is, the, what is the symmetry available? We find that if we take 37 primes up to 37, only 12 primes, total number of added up symmetries is 99.99%. That means we do not need to look at all possibilities. If we take 12 symmetries, how they are organized, we can take random events, integrate them, and we will be able to predict what is actually happening and what is going to happen. And what we did is actually, after writing this, we rotated it into the solutions that we got by calculation into 37 different planes. Because this is the architecture where we give random events and those events integrate together, and they generate, uh, they generate the whole intelligence that was hidden in a random system. So we believe that, um, that any biological system or complex biological systems, while decision-making, they follow this kind of metric by which they are able to, uh, able to generate intelligence without using any software program or any algorithm. So we are continuously testing and verifying how reliable is this. We are not saying that it is 100% accurate or something, but whatever more and more knowledge we are gathering to, to perfect this, uh, this, uh, this pattern is absolute. It's, it's, a, it's a pattern of the primes and which uh, helps us to, to understand how the events are integrated. So, so the last question that I wanted to answer, answer in, in our talk, first is uh, how information looks like, how information gets integrated, and can we have any fundamental device which has the fundamental property of replicating all the biological, biological scenarios? So, we did lots of experiments and um, published papers on different kind of proteins, how they do their information process, how do they do information processing and others. We, we, we made four, four, only four parameters that you need to know and uh, that you need to follow. First is, if you want to make a fundamental device, then you make a zigzag path of transmission, the first one. Second is, you, you make a zigzag by spiraling, but twist the spiral further just like DNA does, or microtubule does, or different uh, alpha helices do. So you make a spiral, but a again give a further twist to create period of periods, a hierarchical periods of the structure. Then third, you give, you, you give at least two or three layers of similar kind of um, spirality. Four, you create an isotropy so that if electromagnetic wave passes through or noise passes through, then they get polarized and create the pattern of silence, or dots of silence. This is the Hamiltonian. I'm not going to explain it. Um, so, <laughs> so for tubulin protein, we predicted the knots of silence. Um, I think I have little time, so I would like to explain what is knots of silence. So, so if light comes in, you know interference. So uh, high intensity region is created and low intensity region is created. So low intensity region are the dark part. So these dark parts under certain condition could operate like a free particle. So it, the proposal came in the 1970s and optical vortices this research field often used to use. And we wanted to detect, we, we, we predicted that this kind of spiral of spiral of spiral or uh, super coil or super super coil which was predicted in 1983 by JF9. Uh, we wanted to verify that. We felt that uh, maybe the, all the fundamental codes of information is written in the alpha helices, and those are written in the code of silence, a geometry of silence. So when they played out, when they vibrate, even randomly when you pump noise, they, they organize the structure of tubulin dimer and then protein uh, microtubule, and they're complex and higher and higher and higher. So to do that, we theoretically calculated what will be the knots of darkness. So these uh, blue lines are actually the silence region, and magnetic rings are those that rings free particles would be generated. So, um, <clears throat> so this is the um, microtubule uh, and the dimer and the monomer. So we, we feel that the biological systems are not electronic devices that you, find, that you purchase in the market. They are not IV, current voltage type. They are psi Q, that is magnetic flux charge type. 
you store the charge and generate magnetic flux. And we did the experiment by inventing a very unique nanotechnology device where you have atomic scale probe and on top of that you have nanowires, two different kind of nanowires so that you take differential signal. And figure C, you look at it, it's the most beautiful result that I wanted to present to you today that we predicted that there should be spiral or not of darkness um, that is governing all the, all the information processing. And on the top row, the bright yellow ones are the electronic density of states, the density of states um, imaging. And in the bottom are magnetic image. So you see monomer in the first two row, dimer in the second two rows, and microtubule in the last three rows. So nanoware, the whole nanoware, you take one dimer, you find the spiral. You take dimer's monomer, again you find the spiral. So the um, spiral of spiral of spiral, or super super coil predicted by Nye, was actually experimentally verified in microtubules. So we understood that what the, the basic uh, information structure that we imagined about microtubule or biological system might be true. Of course, we need further and further investigations. So we measured the vibrations and find out what would be the time crystal for microtubule, and then whole brain. We went on studying uh, the, uh, nowadays you will find many people who, um, who donate the brain of a dead body is, is imaged, totally structure is made and uploaded. So we download those structures and then we simulate to find out what are the key structures. Um, so we found in the brain, uh, you showed that uh, number 12 is very important because 3 into 2 into 2, 2 into 2 into 3. First time you see geometric hierarchical information processing if you have 12 components. But when we are looking into, uh, into brain's architectures thoroughly, what are the different clocks that exist? We found 553 different clocks exist in the brain. And those are categorized into 12 different groups. And we, each group, we, we, we carried out extensive uh, electromagnetic simulation studies and experimental studies in some, some cases and found that the most complex uh, uh, clock network in the brain is the cortex layer, number five. Number two is, was the most surprising thing. Number two was a skin nerve network. It's very, uh, I don't know, because we do experiment and we build up theories based on the experiment. We are not a theoretician. So we can't change this table because it pleases us. But this is very disturbing result, but Skin nerve network is the uh, two, 102 different classes of distinct classes of, of clocks are over there. So you, you may be conscious, not just because of uh, your cortex, maybe skin nerve network in your body is, is also contributing fundamentally to your consciousness. And third is uh, microtubule, fourth is neurons, and then uh, so on and so forth. And all these cases, the studies were carried out, these are the uh, Rajat Jain, uh, age 25, his brain's data. So he simulated it and found out the time crystals. So this is clock inside a clock inside a clock inside a clock inside a clock network for the whole brain. Just to tell the con conventional biology works in a small domain of milliseconds over there. But we try to cover as, as, as long time width as possible. So we have not completed the whole network of clocks in the brain. It was not technologically possible, but what we are saying, the current understanding of neuroscience, we, we, have, we have expanded the bandwidth by at least 10 to the power seven orders of time magnitude. So I am uh, end part of my talk. So I, what I will do is these are the clocks that we have identified in the, in the brain. And these clocks, they come together and operate together. So how they look like, they look like something like this. And, and this goes on, on and on. So it's a huge list of clocks, one by one. So it was an eight years long process to map every single clock in the brain. And there are thousands and thousands of scientists who have worked on it, not us. So in the 60 to 70 years literatures, 
we have surveyed all of them and found where the key clocks are there, how they are connected. And then finally found 553 classes of clocks are sufficient to create a time crystal for the, representing the whole brain. So it is not just our work. So I would like to say that, I mean, uh, for even a small network of one clock connecting three clocks, maybe a PhD thesis of five or six different students. So it was, a, it was a huge effort for mankind which has been compiled here. So when you are seeing it, just imagine uh, what effort the whole, <laughs> whole species, the human species has given just for the brain. Because we, didn't, we did only microtubular neuron. That is our experimental contribution. And uh, these are experimental contribution of many, many researchers. So I will, I will just bypass. This is a cortex domain, neuron, and microtubule. So you have a, we have a special time crystal region for water. I know many of you are interested in water. Water becomes very effective when it comes to microtubule because inside microtubule there are 17 nanometer wide water crystalline. So that, that plays contribution to the clocks. So all possibilities we have cross-checked for microtubules and then uh, this is the whole brain, how it looks like, okay? Uh, sorry, this is the whole brain. So this is the PhD thesis of my student, whose PhD thesis is mapping the time crystal of the whole human brain. And this year, July, we will upload all the data. So of course, you can understand that he is not a normal human being who has done this. <laughs> I mean, I, sometimes some of your students, they super pass you. When he first came to Japan, I still remember I purchased uh, six dress for him because he didn't know how to dress or, or something like that. He never used to eat, sometimes used to eat and sometimes don't. But now, if I say something, I get at least 100 times return. And then I, I, I just think that what shall I say next? So this is my situation now. <laughs> so what we, what we saw today, one, one particular point that excited me a lot, and I would like to share that passion in the last three minutes that I have. This particular thing is, when I, whenever I used to hear anybody, um, uh, especially different conferences or, or in the literatures or in the, in the internet when you search, somebody comes out 432 hertz, that is the magic frequency, and I, it gives you consciousness. And then somebody comes out, this number, pi, that is giving everything in the universe. And then some people are crazy about some numbers, some ratios, something. I never thought that I will be, a, uh, be that kind of hoodoo scientist someday <laughs> who will tell that, look, 12 has something to do. <laughs> so we, we saw, when, when we were doing the calculation, then we saw that 3 into 2 into 2, 2 into 2 into 3 is the first number in the number system where you find hierarchical geometry or triangular geometry is embedded in the vibrations. So that is not in the hardware. But when we finished the mapping of the whole brain, now we discover that even the components, we got 12 different components where we have a hierarchical network. And those components, each one of them has 12, 12, 12, 12. So at least three times hierarchical geometrical structures are created. That means by following this model, we are in a situation where uncertainties, even within the domain of certainty, is enormous. That's what I felt that at least we keep the space for free will to be there. <laughs> and so what I've tried to do is, um, is, um, is to answer a few questions. I'm not saying all of these are correct. One day, some of these will be, um, will be found to be wrong and will be corrected by uh, far, far further serious scientists. But what I have tried to do is at least to, to find out, um, uh, to, to start a debate that how the information looks like in nature or in, um, uh, in the biological system, so that, um, and how a life form we, I, I showed you the video of the metric, how the metric, uh, they interact without software, they could do it. And uh, I have not videos, but in our lab in Japan, we are building the computer, where there will be no software programming, 
but still it should be able to interact much more. So I have interacted a couple of times, Sophia, not because she's beautiful, but she is interacting. I mean, <laughs> she is interacting, and she doesn't like me. Of course, she doesn't like Roger Penrose even, even more, because he, <laughs> she asked her out, <laughs> at least. So the complex bioengineering with a simple device. So I proposed also a very simple device. You have to have zigzag structure. You have to have a spiral of a spiral periodicity. And um, you, have, you, have to, you should be able to create interference silence. So last year when I gave a presentation, or last couple of years, I was continuously arguing that silence is the way nature encodes information, not the sound. Then after the lecture, many people from you, many of you, um, told me that Anirban, actually when you say silence, actually it is the gap between two sounds. Otherwise, where there is a silence. So what you are saying is wrong. So I was quite disturbed. I didn't like your comment. Absolutely didn't like it. <laughs> so I went back. I did the experiment, the interference experiment. And now the result I presented today was the darkness lines. Those are pure darkness. So why nature? It was my concern. Why nature does this kind of things? The nature does this kind of things because light can have different gradient of intensity. Extremely complex variation of electromagnetic wave, but silence is pure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anirban. This was a great talk, very challenging, very inspiring. And I just want to I just want to, I just don't want to reflect on all these 553, 553 timescales going on in my mind at the same time? At least, at least. At least, okay. At least. Thank you very much. Next speaker will be, yes. The next speaker will be George Ellis. Uh, George is from the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And he has become uh, well known already many years ago for his work on cosmology and general relativity. Uh, in the recent one or two decades, his focus has changed though. Now he is working a lot on emergence and dynamical systems, uh, mental causation, and these issues. And he uh, will give us a talk about top down effects underlying the emergence of mind and intelligence. Please welcome with me George Ellis. Thank you. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, thanks to the organizers for asking me. So I've been thinking about this for about 15 years. And the starting point is Francis Crick. You, your joys, your sorrows, your memories, your ambitions, your sense of personal identity and free will are no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. So we've got this contrast between the picture of the whole person, the living, vibrant, um, feeling person, and this machine view. Uh, this picture is from Monopolizing Knowledge by Ian Hutchinson. So, the attack is actually wider than what Francis Crick. There are some physicists who claim the brain is nothing but a combination of atoms, so it's physics alone that really determines what happens. My friend Martin Rees is one of those people who says, if you just knew the physics of the brain in detail, you could predict everything, and all this other stuff is pure fluff on top of the real action, which is the physics. Some geneticists hope to explain our behavior fully in terms of genetic determinism. Many neuroscientists want to reduce brain activity to nothing more than molecular interactions in neurons, as that Francis Quick quote says. So are we really nothing but particles interacting via physics? And there's a hint. Those, those three views I've given here are incompatible with each other. If it's all determined by physics without remainder, there is no room for neuroscience to get a toehold because physics is already there. And that's a hint to the answer to this. So the basis of the nervous system is its structural organization, molecules at the bottom, synapses, neurons, networks, maps, systems, the central nervous system itself. That's a picture from Churchland and Sanofsky. 
And everybody who's looked at the, neural, uh, the, the nervous system will understand that. Now, the basic principles, brain plasticity underlies change all the time based on adaptive selection at both macro and micro level. So brain plasticity is a core feature of what's happening both at the micro level, the neuron level, the synapse level, and at the macro level, the way that we behave. Neuronal connections are continually adjusted in response to the environment, and this is what I'll be talking about. Bottom-up action by genes and neurons underlies higher level activity, so yes, there is this bottom-up stuff taking place, but in addition, top-down causation guides lower level activity, and that's what I want to explain. And in particular, our thoughts and intentions choose what happens. So we've got this hierarchy, particle physics, atomic physics, chemistry, biochemistry, cell biology, botany, zoology, physiology, psychology, sociology, economics, and politics. And that upward arrow is the one which the reductionists are emphasizing. So microphysics underlies macrophysics, for instance, the kinetic theory of gases. Physics underlies chemistry, the wonderful discovery last century of the nature of the chemical bond explained by quantum physics uh, and the Pauli exclusion principle. Molecular biology underlies the functioning of the cell, one of the most fundamental discoveries of biology ever to be made by Crick and Watson. And then neurobiology underlies the functioning of the brain, this ongoing discovery of how the detailed neural um, connections un underlie what happens at the psychological level. And we've been hearing a lot about that at this meeting. So this is the bottom-up emergence which does indeed take place. But is that the whole story? No, it isn't. It's only part of the story. Top-down causation also takes place, and physics is not all that there is. So as well, there is this top-down arrow. So for instance, epigenetics determines what happens in cell biology. Cell processes initiate chemical cycles. The mind controls physiological events such as walking, and thoughts initiate motions of electrons and atoms in our arms in order to do things. And this is what I'm going to be explicating as we go through this. So what happens is there are top-down effects in modular hierarchies. We, we are a modular hierarchical structure. You can't get complexity without the modular, the hierarchy, and the structure. Physiological processes occur via both bottom-up emergence and top-down realization, and in this way, the lower levels carry out the work, but the higher levels decide what will be done. This occurs in three different cases, evolutionary processes, developmental processes, and functioning on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. And the fact that this takes place fundamentally changes the picture and undermines those reductionist views of the mind. Um, so, but I must emphasize, this in no way means physics is violated. I'm not saying physics is suspended or overwritten. On the contrary, physics is co-opted for the higher level purposes in these higher level structures. So please don't believe that I'm saying that these top-down things, that thoughts prevent, alter physics, change physics. That is not the case. The physics is unchanged. It is co-opted for higher level purposes. Now, in the case of biology, this is a picture by Dennis Noble based on his detailed study of the heart. It's, it's the same thing, genes, proteins, network, subcellular machinery, cells, tissues, organs, or organism. And there's the bottom-up arrows, which are there in the middle, showing this bottom-up emergence, but there are the top-down ones, which occur in all biological systems. The, from the organs, uh, signals go down and trigger cell signaling. From the tissues and the organs, signals go down and change the mechanisms which read the genes, the gene regulatory networks, and the, 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 the protein and RNA networks have a machinery which selects, reads, and connects genes. So there are these three crucial downward arrows in all biological functioning, as Dennis Noble has written at great length in some wonderful books. Now, in terms of the brain, the different areas, senses and attention, memory, prediction, planning, action, social neuroscience, evolution and adaptation, and the integrated whole. Now, actually, 
at a certain level, separating them out is, is a false thing. They all take place in an integrated way all the time, but we've got to think about things, so we, I'm going to s separate them out in order to be able to go through them one by one. So, there's a wonderful book by David Marr called Vision, which occurred in 1982. And he put down the basic idea of what happens in all thought processes. There's a computational theory, there's a representation and algorithm, and there's a hardware implementation. The computational theory, the question is, what is the goal of the computation? Why is it appropriate? And what is the logic of the strategy by which it can be carried out? That's the high-level question which occurs in all biological systems. That chains down from level one to level two to the representation and algorithm level. How can this computational theory be implemented? In particular, what is the representation for the input and output, and what is the algorithm for the transformation? And that then chains down to the hardware implementation. How can the representation and algorithm be realized physically? So this is David Mars. He was thinking of vision, but this applies much, much more widely in the mind at large. Now, he used the word algorithm, and in deference to Roger Penrose, who's coming up, algorithm can be replaced by method or something else. In some cases, it really is an algorithm, and I'll give you an example. The problem that is to be faced at the top level is to take incoming sensory data and understand it. And the problem is the Helmholtz inverse problem. We have to infer the nature of three-dimensional space and motion from two-dimensional data. This is actually an absolutely fundamental. We see a two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional world. We have to understand the three-dimensional world on the basis of this reduced set of data. And Helmholtz wrote about this a long while ago. The method used is to predict what we should be seeing on the basis of past experience and immediate past data, and then to check that prediction out by current incoming data. So prediction is core to what is happening in vision. Thus, we do not just process incoming data in a forward manner, we unconsciously interpret it in a contextually based way in order to produce what we see. So now there's a very ordinary picture of a pickup truck in front of a theater. Now, the thing about it, which you probably haven't thought about up to now, is you can't see the theater behind the pickup truck. So the question for you is, does the theater exist behind the pickup truck? <laughs> okay, well in fact, the pickup truck hides part of the building, so we can't see that part of the thing. Our mind automatically fills in the fact that the building is there. The building as a whole is there. It's not as if there was a bit of the building miss missing in the shape of the pickup truck in that image. Thus, we see what actually is in our minds compensating for missing information. We have learned to see on the basis of past experience. And Chris Frith's book, Making Up the Mind, is a wonderful description of how that happens. The brain fills in missing information to make a meaningful pattern. So many of you will be able to see the letter E there. There is no E there. There are three lines which the mind interprets as giving you the letter E. This famous one, most of you will see two triangles there. There is no triangle there. There are three um, segments, uh, little uh, se line segments, and three circles with segments missing, our mind sees the triangle. You can't actually help but see the triangles. And it's not that you think there are triangles there. You see triangles as being there. The same way as you see the E, you can't help it. And this one's an interesting one. You can probably see this thing going f from left to right. It's not actually going from left to right. Nothing is going from left to right. What is happening is the left one is flashing and the right one is flashing and they're doing it in such a way that you see it moving, but nothing is actually moving from left to right. Now, the way this happens has been set out by Richard Gregory and in his book, Iron Brain, The Psychology of Seeing. And he gave this diagram there. There are general rules going to a hypothesis generator. So you generate a hypothesis about what it's doing. You do so on the basis of your conceptual knowledge and percep perceptual knowledge, which acts down on this hypothesis generator. From the bottom, sensed reality, the, si the signals from outside are coming up. That's bottom up from the eyes. It goes through a signal processing process, which actually is, takes place in the thalamus. 
And there is a top-down loop from the hypothesis generator to the thalamus, and that's where this kind of filling in takes place, and it generates the output of what you see, the perceived object. That then feeds back to the experience to help you see even better in the future. So feeding into your conceptual knowledge and your perceptual knowledge. And so note the downward flow in particular from the neocortex to the thalamus. This is the kind of top-down causation which enables perception to take place. So uh, the kind of article in the literature about this, top-down influences on visual processing by Gilbert and Lee, re-entrant or feedback pathways between cortical areas carry rich and varied information about behavioral context, including attention, expectation, perceptual tasks, working memory, and motor commands. In this review, we discuss the various top-down influences exerted on the visual cortical pathways and highlight the dynamic nature of the receptor field which allows neurons to carry information that is relevant to the current perceptual demands, and that's from Nature Reviews and Neuroscience. The Anil Seth talk also talked about this. Perceptions are not constructed using top, are constructed using top-down information, not just using sensory data. So I refer back also to Anil Seth's talk. Part of vision is attention. Perception is crucially shaped by attention. First. In terms of directing cognitive processes in one direction rather than another, the spotlight of selective attention and global workspace theory. And second, by, for example, moving eye muscles to focus the eyes and point eyes in one direction rather than another. These are both top-down effects from the choice of the attention focus to neurons and muscles. And a typical paper on this is Gazali and Nobre, top-down modulation, bridging selective attention and working memory from trends in cognitive science. Okay, memory prediction and planning. Memory is implemented by altering neural connection strengths. How? By altering gene expression in neurons, and this was expl explicated by Kandel, Eric Kandel, in his Nobel Prize winning work on aplasia. Our memories, events, and understandings get embodied in those connections, patterns, and strengths. So our memory, something that happened outside, gets written in to our neural connections. Thus, for example, less, lessons learned in class, such as multiplication tables, change these connections. This is top-down action from the lesson in the school to the details of our neuronal synapses. Prediction is via the pattern recognition and prediction properties of neural networks, not necessarily algorithmic, using memory, and so the memory feeds back into this prediction, and planning is via logical processes of assessing alternative outcomes and choosing between them via a selection criterion, and that's what I want to focus on. So what happens in planning? The logic of the higher levels chooses what will happen. The logic of the lower levels carries out the logic that the higher levels have selected. Thus, the higher levels have greater causal power. The higher level aims are realized by electron flows at the lower levels. The low level logic base is given by ion channels or the lock and key recognition mechanism that is central to molecular biology. So, level one, I'm going to bake a cake. That's the decision you've made. That sets the direction of what happens. Level two is the recipe. This is the algorithm which derives what happens. Get the ingredients, two cups of flour, one teaspoon salt, two large eggs, etc. the directions. Preheat the oven, sift together the ingredients, pour into a greased pan, bake for 20 minutes, combine milk and flour, and about, that's the algorithm which is going to determine what will happen. Okay, this gets activated in neural networks by spike trains and oscillatory bindings. And no one knows how thoughts are represented by the spike trains, but they are represented by the spike trains. This goes down to the level of the neurons where the action potentials go along from one synapse through the nucleus, the axon, next synapses, and so on. There's a summation that takes place at the synapses. Uh, according to that, um, that the, the, the shape of, of the, the reaction um, at the synapses to what's going on. At, at the level of action potentials, you have sodium uh, channels opening, the current increases, the sodium channel closes, uh, more, the, the potassium channels open, then the potassium channel closes, this generates the spike. It happens at the lower level by flows of ions rather than electrons. 
generated by sodium, potassium, chlorine, and charged phospholipids, the iron gradients, um, and this, the, these ions flow in and out and generate the action potential, and what enables this to happen is voltage-gated ion channels, and these are the magic where physics and biology meet. These are these incredible biomolecules seen from the side and the left, and seen from the top at the right, an overhead view of a voltage-dependent potassium ion channel showing four red to paddles that open and close in response to positive and negative charges. This controls how the potassium ions move in and out of the cell. So the, 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 the algorithm to make the cake is channeled down and controls in the end which electrons flow in and out of which sodium and potassium ion channels. And so the overall process, the chef has an idea for the cake, he gets the algorithm, he looks up his recipe book, it produces the cake itself, which is the physical product, and the abstract idea, which is the, 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 um, the recipe. That is what determines what happens in terms of electrons flowing through his hands in order to produce that physical product. The algorithm controls what happens. The physics, the electron and ion flows enable the algorithm to determine what happens, but they do not choose what happens. It's the algorithm which chooses what happens. Consciousness itself also depends on an interaction between bottom-up and top-down signals, and Mashur's plenary talk went into this in some detail, and um, work on anesthetics, bottom-up and top-down mechanisms of general anesthetics modulate different dimensions of consciousness. So this bottom-up, top-down interplay takes place also in terms of consciousness itself. Now, action. I've already talked, but I'm just going to carry on with this a bit, from ideas in the brain to changes in the world as in Mars scheme. You have a hierarchical plan in the mind and the, the, an abstract algorithm that gets realized in currents, flows, and muscles, and electrons dance to the tune of that abstract plan. So here's a Pilates class. There is an idea or purpose in the teacher's mind. From that idea, the, the idea is that we're going to get healthy in some kind of way, we're going to strengthen ourselves. Then we develop a specific exercise plan, so you see again Mars, two levels, the top level, the second level. The instructor gives instructions to the person taking the class, now that's a verbal thing, so you're transmitting the exercise plan verbally and it gets realized in that person's brain. That person then forms intentions which flow down to the muscles and lead to motions of the muscles. And so the flow of causation is the molecules and the muscles move according to the plan in the instructor's mind. Well, more or less, okay. This is a top-down causation from a concept to motion of electrons in the muscles. The electrons do not cause what happens, they enable it. Action such as this is based on internal models, and Walpert et al., an internal model for sensory motor integration, say the following, a sensory motor integration task was investigated in which participants estimated the location of one of their hands at the end of movements made in the dark and under externally imposed forces. The temporal propagation of errors in this task was analyzed within the theoretical framework of optimal state estimation. These results provide direct support for the existence of an internal model sensory motor integration and the model provide direct for the existence of an internal model. And that model is the causal agent that directs what happens. And they have a very, very nice paper, a unifying computational framework for motor control and social interaction, showing that the same kind of things occur in motor control and social interaction. That's Walpert et al. Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. And they again have a picture which is very, very much the Ma picture, symbolic representation of tasks or the goal, mid-level representation, sequels of elements, and low-level dynamics, elements of movements. And that's what happens again in action. Now, social neuroscience is the next example. The brain does not exist in isolation. It's absolutely fundamental. We have social brains structured to a large degree by the society in which they live. Top-down action takes place all the time from society to the details of our brain structure. For instance, the conference program language is English. Why? Because we live, this is taking place in a society where English dominates. 
Each of our brains, if you are understanding the English, have got detailed wiring in your, at, at, uh, and synapse strengths which enable you to understand English. Why you were taught that, either because it's your home language or in some class or other, society fed the knowledge of English into your brain and got incorporated in the details of the microstructure of your, uh, of your neurons. And this is a general example of what Merlin Do Donald writes about social influence of the right mind, Merlin Donald's wonderful book, Origins of the Modern Mind. The externalization of memory was initially very gradual with the invention of the first permanent external symbols, but then it accelerated and the numbers of external representational devices now available has altered how humans use their biologically given cognitive resources what they can know, where that knowledge is stored, and what kinds of codes are needed to decipher what is stored. The human cognitive system, down to the level of its internal modular organization, is affected not only by its genetic inheritance, but also by its own peculiar cultural history. And a typical example of social neuroscience from nature, more hippocampal neurons in adult mice living in an enri en enriched environment. If you take mice and put them in an interesting environment, they get much more neurons in the dentate gyrus than if they do if you put them in a boring cage with nothing interesting to do. Okay, our brain structures have got to be what they are through evolutionary processes that at the macro level have created some hardwire aspects of the brain and some softwire aspects. At the macro level, the major brain domains and the interconnections between them. At the micro level, evolutionary processes have led to development of many types of neurons, developmental systems that bring them and the overall brain pattern into being, and molecules, specifically proteins, that enable this all to happen. Adaptation takes place at all time on evolutionary, developmental, and functional timescales. And this raises the issue, what is nature and what is nurture? I could talk at length about this, and so I'll just say I've recently done a book with Mark Solms called Beyond Evolutionary Psychology, which discusses this in detail. But however it works, all of this adaptation is a top-down effect from the physical, social, and ecological environment to the details of the brain. If these environments were different, the outcomes would be different, and that's the hallmark of top-down action. If you were to change the environment, like if you were brought up in a Spanish-speaking country rather than English, the details of your brain connections would be different. So finally, integrator views and outcomes. The basic point is one cannot understand the large-scale course causal processes in the brain without taking top-down causation into account in each of the areas just discussed. There certainly are reductive aspects to what is going on, but they cannot by themselves encompass the nature of causation in the brain as a whole. Hence, the strong reductive views of brain function, such as that Crick quote I gave at the beginning, omit key aspects of what is going on. And this is an example from Solms and Panksepp, what is neuropsychoanalysis? Two-way or circular causation. At the top, you've got tertiary process cognitions, largely neocortical. At the bottom, you've got primary process emotions, subcortical. These bottom-up influence what the secondary processes, the basal ganglia and the upper limbic. <coughs> these influence in a bottom-up way the tertiary processes. But there are these top-down loops from the tertiary processes down to the secondary and from the secondary down to the primary. And so again, any serious attempt to look at the brain as a whole must have these top-down links as well as the bottom-up ones. Can Eric Kandel's principle for psychiatry. All mental processes derive from operations of the brain. Genes determine neuronal functioning. Social and developmental factors contribute importantly to the variance in mental illness. These factors express themselves in altered gene expression. Altered gene expression induced by learning gives rise to change patterns of neural connections which give rise to different forms of thinking and behavior. Psychotherapy produces changes in long-term behavior by learning, which produces changes in gene expression and hence changes in neuronal interconnection. Again, that top-down thing which I have been talking about. So processes at the psychological level can act down to the neuronal level and alter what is going on there. 
A particularly interesting example is language. Reading does not work by reading phonemes and assembling them to understand words. Again, there's an ongoing holistic process that takes place whereby the cortex predicts what should be seen, filling in missing data, and interprets what is seen on the basis of expectations in the current context. The basic principle is the higher levels do not make sense without the higher level context. Text is read in a top-down manner. Just as in the case of vision, the higher level set the context for understanding. So the horses ran across the plain, the plain landed rather fast, I used the plain to smooth the wood. The nature of the word plain depends on context. Even the nature of a word depends on context. Time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana. Language functions in a coherent contextual way with ambiguity and redundance as central features. You can't reliably read in a bottom-up manner because not only the meaning but even pronunciation depends on context. So, tough, arch, and fort, her wound hurt, she wound the clock. You, can't, you, you have to have the context. Phonemes by themselves do not have a unique sound. Reading miswritten text, you can read this even though it's not phonemically correct, and this the letters are wrong, and this the words are missing. The fact you could read the above proves that the mind continually guesses and fills in all the time searching for meaning. This process is driven top down, else it could not work. Ne listening and reading are both psycholinguistic uh, guessing games, and Thomas Beaver has talked about this in listening, Kenneth Goodman and Stephen Strauss in reading. The message is always incomplete and hinted at. You fill in details from contextual knowledge and guesses about what the intended message is. It is not a mechanical process, it's contextual through and through. So Beaver on Goodman, Ken's radical idea was that the flow of literary information is not uniformly upward. Rather, it is cyclic, such that information at each level can inform processes at levels below it. This has major educational impl implications. This understanding has key educational implications as regard teaching how to read. You go a bottom-up, phonics-based route, trying first to get the mechanics of reading sorted out and worry later on about meaning, or do you do a top-down, understanding-based route, get reading, writing for meaning going first, sort out the details later? My wife, Carol, is heavily involved in doing this. Do you try to get children to grasp the meaning in a text, or do you try to get them to decode it without worrying about whether it has any meaning for them? This is a crucial educational question, and we have an abomination taking place in many countries of testing children on meaningless phonemes when any child with any sass will say, why the heck am I being asked to read meaningless stuff? So summary, causation takes place horizontally at each of these levels there. There's bottom-up emergence and there's top-down realization. All levels are equally real, causation takes place at each level. Emergence is bottom-up and realization is top-down. An important feature which I haven't had time to talk about, which is key to all of this, multiple lower level realizability takes place for each higher level function. The higher level functions determine equivalence classes of electron flows, not specific electron flows, and that's a key feature of top-down causation. So real emergence takes place in the brain with higher levels having genuine causal power and information processing capacities at each level. This is enabled by bottom-up emergence in conjunction with top-down realization on evolutionary development and functional timescales. Adaptation takes place to physical, ecological, and social environments on all these timescales, and that is a top-down process. And two references, Did My Neurons Make Me Do It? by Nancy Murphy and Warren Brown, and my own book, How Can Physics Underlie the Mind? Top-down causation in the human context. Thank you so much, George. I've never seen someone finish so precisely in time, you know. <laughs> to sum it all up, it's top down all the way from the bottom up. I, I, I love this picture because you can't help but see a face there. Yes, that's it's right. That's right. Now, thank you very much, George, for the next speaker we need to introduce some really revolutionary innova technical innovation here, which will take a few minutes, just a few minutes. So please don't leave the room. I think this will be going on pretty quickly. And I ask the technical team just to come up here.
That will be for the talk by Roger Penrose. We are, as you can see here, this is the new innovation in technology, projection technology um, 5.2 or whatever. It's specifically designed for this talk, for the presentation by Roger Penrose from the University of Oxford. Roger doesn't need any extended introduction. I only want to say that he completes our travel through the globe from Asia through Africa, and now we're back to Europe. So, Roger Penrose. Well, I not only very much appreciate being asked to give a talk here, but also the chaos that I always cause by trying to use my old-fashioned techniques here. Uh, so they have to use more and more modern techniques to deal with me. But uh, anyway, I hope you can see these things. Um, this is, yeah. Trouble is I can't read my own things. This is, I, I'll just paraphrase it because I can't read what I'm seeing. My eyes are not good enough to read it. So uh, the idea is that w <clears throat> people always ask what consciousness is. I don't really address that question generally. There are all sorts of things, attributes, things which are attributed to consciousness and are part of it clearly, such as the feeling of pain, the appreciation of a color, uh, happiness, uh, all sorts of things to do with consciousness. Now. I came from a mathematical background, that's my, what my uh, degrees were in, in mathematics, and uh, I therefore look at the subject from a slightly jaundiced point of view, if you like, or not the usual one. But nevertheless, when I was a graduate student, I uh, went to lectures on mathematical logic and, mathemati and cosmology and on um, quantum mechanics, which were not the subjects I was supposed to be doing, but they influenced me more, I think, than anything else I did as a graduate student. Particularly with regard to the mathematical logic, I had been puzzled before about uh, Gödel's theorem and that there seemed to be things in mathematics that you couldn't prove. I didn't like the idea of that, but in this course, it made it clear what was going on. And so that, together with my course on, courses on relativity and particularly quantum mechanics, where I uh, went to a course of lectures by the great Paul Dirac, uh, and I learned a lot from all those courses. Now, uh, the question that I'm going to address, the feature of consciousness that I'm going to address, not because I think it's the most important necessarily, or I think it is important, but it's the only one where I really have something to say about it, and that is the term understanding. And I believe that in mathematics, you can show that understanding is not a computational process. It's just simply having algorithms in your head cannot address understanding. And that's what I learned from the Gödel theorem. So that's what I want to talk about here. And uh, see what I said here. Yes, particularly mathematical understanding. But if I talk about mathematics, it's not that I think that mathematics is anything special about this. It's just that's the only thing I really can say something serious about and make a positive contribution. And the positive contribution, I sh should say, is a negative one. Namely, that uh, computers don't. Consciousness is doing something that computers don't. But before going into the more complete arguments, I want to show you something which is a bit new. Those things I've been talking about endlessly, what I've just said. Uh, so I want to say something a bit new. So I made up a few chess problems. This is a particular one of them. Um, I think it's the one mainly I want to talk about. It's if you, anybody who knows the rules of chess, you don't have to be a good player, you just have to know the rules and look at the position for a few minutes, and you will see it is an obvious draw. That is to say, these, there's excessive black pieces, you've got two extra bits. I should point out that people complain that you've got bishops on the same color, that doesn't make it an impossible position. I grew up with a father who was a distinguished pro chess problemist, and one of the things I learned from this, one of the few things I learned relative, relevant to this, is that a chess position for, to be a decent problem has to be a legal one. So there has to be a way of getting to that position, even if it's completely stupid the way you do it. And the fact that there are three black bishops on the same color is perfectly legal because you can work out they could have been made by queening, well, bishoping, the pawns. That, that you, there are some pawns that black doesn't have, I guess, 
uh, three of them, and you could, those could be, certainly two of them could be used to make the bishops stupidly on the same color, but that's not what I'm talking about. Okay, so the black pieces are all stuck in here, apart from that bishop which can run around. And the white pieces, if you just leave, well, what can white do? Nothing. So it's a draw. It's obvious draw. Okay, you give this position to Fritz, the leading, uh, I guess it's the leading chess computer program, chess machine, whatever you call it. And then you ask it what its view of this position is. And its view is that it's a win for black. So you can see it's completely wrong to start with. It has no conception about these pieces being some trapped in here and don't count when you try to make the estimate. I didn't, didn't do too mu know too much about the, the way the thing was programmed, but I knew enough about it to realize it would be fooled in this case. But I didn't quite realize initially is it even stupider than that. And I, I think it's, well, it's easy to see here how stupid it is. After a little while, it simply either sacrifices the bishop, which is utterly stupid, or else it stops protecting that pawn here and moves somewhere else and allows you to take it off with the king. Also completely stupid. Now, why does it do that? Well, you know it does that because its algorithm is, program, program, is programmed that it's judged that it's a win for black just by counting up pieces or playing zillions and zillions of moves. Well, zillions is probably only about 60 or something. But uh, those moves, it tries the position after all the possible ways that these moves can take place, and it sees whether the position is improved or not, and how does it know that? Well, try counting bishops count so much, rooks count so much, knights count so much, queens count so much, and using that assessment, it still judges it's a win for black. Okay, well, that's stupid, but what's even more stupid is that it sacrifi either sacrifices the bishop or it moves away so the king can take that pawn and allows all the pawns to, and then you get three queens and there's, you, they can batter their way through, the, through here quite with no problem, and so it's win for white. Now, why does Fritz do that? Well, it knows that there are various rules repeating the same position three times of the same player to move is a draw. And so it's desperately trying to avoid that. The other thing is if a piece doesn't move or a pawn get, uh, a piece doesn't get taken or a pawn doesn't move, get moved for so many moves, then again, it's just a draw. And it's so desperate not to draw because it thinks it's a win that it does something desperate like sacrificing the bishop and doing that, then these pawns can all be released and they can make three queens and you just bash your way through. Okay, well, I'd like to improve this a little bit. You don't need quite so many pawns there. And if you're a little bit clever, you can do it with two. I won't go into this because it's not really part of my talk, but I like to play around with this. Uh, and uh, Fritz still makes the stupid mistakes. And um, with two queens, it's quite easy to win. And you can do it with one queen with this position if you don't have quite so many bishops. I'm not going to talk about these, really. They're nice to play with, and they're a bit of fun. But uh, they don't tell you too much. In fact, somebody would say, seeing this position, they'd say, oh, well, I could reprogram Fritz so it'll deal with that position or those types of positions. Well, I know that. You could certainly make it deal with this initial position. You just say, if you see this position, uh, don't make that stupid move or so on and judge it to be a draw. I mean, yeah, that's another algorithm, a slightly more complicated one, but Fritz didn't make that algorithm. Some, some brash person who decided he could defeat this position said, yes, of course. But the point is that you cannot allow an algorithm where a human being comes along and changes the algorithm when you see that it doesn't always work. Where does the understanding come from? It doesn't come from the algorithm, it comes from the human being. So this is the big point that I want to make. Um, but of course chess is a finite game and it doesn't really come to terms with things like the Gödel theorem, which was why, really why I thought that understanding is something definitely beyond computation. So, First of all, let me say that all these things have to do with the infinite. Sometimes people say, well, you can't really imagine infinity, but that's one thing you definitely can do and computers can't do. And this is where the differences between understanding and pure computation really begin to show up when you talk about the infinite. For example, you could have a program, well, you could have a, quite an easy statement. You could say if you take two even numbers and add them together, you're going to get another even number. That's a pretty obvious statement, but it's a statement about an infinite number of things. So you can't just say, well, we can't think about the infinite, because just that you just did. Realize that any two even numbers added together give you another even number. Well, you can make computers do that sort of thing. Uh, 
that is to say, we don't mean by that sort of thing. But first of all, I should say, what is a Turing machine? And the Turing machine can deal with the infinite, but in finite ways. And this cartoon I drew in order to illustrate it. Here is the Turing machine in the middle. It's a little finite thing, and it has this tape, which is potentially infinite. So these old trucks full of, full of tape, you see. Uh, it, it, they have to wheel these things backwards and forwards and all that, but the infinity is only in the potential infinity of uh, the tape that you have here. But the, the workings of the machine are always finite, but then you have information that are put on the tape, and there has to be no limit on how big that information can be. And the Turing machine treats the infinite in that way, and we know from our school days that one way of treating the infinite is in terms of induction. Now, induction, ordinary induction is, if you're talking about natural numbers, and by a natural number I mean a whole number, which is positive, including zero. Some people don't include zero, but I prefer to include zero. So a non-negative whole number is a natural number. Zero, one, two, three, four, etc. Now, if you want to prove something which holds for all natural numbers, then there's an easy way of doing it with just a finite number of things. You prove it for zero, and then you prove it, if it's true for n, for some n, then it's true for n plus one, then you've established it's true for all numbers. So you can prove things for the infinite. Now, that's fine. Um, I was going to give you an example which really shows a case which goes beyond this. And it's a very nice example, but since last night, I had another idea which I think is more important to talk about than that. So at the end of my talk, I'm going to talk about the other idea, which is something which I should have thought of at least 20 years ago. And, <laughs> and uh, for some reason, it only came to me last night, which, is, <laughs> which you could say is just in the nick of time. Um, I had a very useful conversation with Stuart about something which had started to trouble me again. And I'll come to that at the end, so as long as I don't forget to say it, which is possible. Um, now, this is, this is uh, more or less a, a version of Gödel's theorem, but it's Turing's version of Gödel's theorem. And I'm going to say it just in words, in a quite simple way, but, but you can see the, the power of it. Now, I'm interested, say, in theorems about natural numbers. Now, a theorem could be that every even number it, uh, if you add two even numbers together, you get another even number. That would be a theorem, and you can prove that using some basic axioms. Or something more sophisticated, such as every, every natural number is the sum of four square numbers. That's a theorem due to Lagrange, which is pretty difficult to prove. Even Euler couldn't do it, uh, so that's pretty difficult. But that's an example of the sort of thing you know. Or Fermat's last theorem, which took Andrew Wiles a long time to finally to establish its truth after 400 years. And so he didn't try for 400 years, but uh, <laughs> the theorem was there for 400 years. Um, <clears throat> but these are the sort of thing I'm talking about. Things about numbers like that, are they true or false? Now the question is, can you have a computer, well, an algorithm, an algorithmic system, which could be checked on a computer? That's the whole point. A system of rules that a computer could check, which says yes or no to statements like that. And so R stands for the rules. And what Gödel shows is that if you trust R, that's to say, if using those rules, if you have reason to believe by understanding the rules enough, if you have reason to believe that by following the rules, you only get truths, that it says, yes, it's true, only if the rule, I mean, if the rules are followed correctly, then it is actually true. And you've established that the rules you put in are obvious enough to you, establish clear enough truths that you're prepared to believe that the algorithm only gives you truths. Okay, if you have a set like that, that you trust what the rules give you, what well, Gödel shows that there is a statement, G of R, which, dependent on those rules, you can see two things. One is that it is not derivable by the rules, and secondly, it's true. How do you know it's true? You know it's true by virtue of your trust in the rules. So it's a very strange thing. It means your belief in the rules, your trust in the rules, is stronger than the rules themselves. The rules can't get at that thing, but the fact that you believe those rules to give, to give you only true results does get you there. It's a very remarkable thing, and when I've learned a bit about this from 
a chap called Steen, who was our lecturer in, in, in logic in Cambridge at the time, and the, he sort of made, made, phrased the things in that language, and I said, yes, gosh, that's, that's really good. It means that Gödel's theorem doesn't tell you there are untruth, unprovable truths. It tells you that no algorithmic system can, achieve, can get to all those truths. You need to use your understanding somewhere in order to get them. So I, then I thought, well, what can be running around in our brains? And are we just um, machines like Newtonian machines, with cogs and wheels and things like that? Or do you need to go beyond that? Do you need relativity? Do you need quantum mechanics? And most of these things you can see, at least to high enough approximation, you could put it on a computer. The Newtonian things you could put on a computer, relativity things you could put on a computer. Quantum mechanics, well, you could take the Schrodinger equation, if you like, well, that means unitary evolution. It's another way of saying the, thing, saying the same thing. Um, unitary evolution, you could put the Schrodinger equation on a computer. It's a bit more difficult to do for various reasons, but nevertheless, you could do that. But that doesn't tell you what's going to happen, because what's going to happen isn't a solution of the Schrodinger equation. What the Schrodinger equation tells you is probabilities of one thing or another. At least that's not what Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation tells you. That's how you interpret it. And Schrodinger himself was uh, very clear to point out the problems with his own theory, because he said, well, you could have a cat which was dead and alive at the same time, and he more or less introduced that cat not to show you, yeah, you could have a cat which is dead and alive at the same time, but to show, look, this is an absurdity. There is something wrong, there's something more than the subject that we know which needs to be there. And people rather reluctant to face up to this, they tend to think, well, quantum mechanics is the best theory you've ever had, it proves all sorts of things. The trouble is, being the best theory isn't good enough because it's self-inconsistent. That is to say, the Schrodinger evolution of a system does not give you what the world does. And then you have to go off into some route, or usually the route where there are many worlds all going on at once, all in superposition. I don't want to follow up that rule because I think it's a lot more complicated than, well, you see, the problem is that people are very reluctant to question quantum mechanics itself. When I say people, this does not include at least three of the major figures in the subject. Einstein, Schrodinger, and Dirac himself, who formulated the rules that everybody used and the notations and all that. He himself, he was a little reluctant to say what he thought, but in later life he was quite prepared to say he thought quantum mechanics, as we now have it, is a provisional theory and there should be a better one. So the great figures in this say that, so I don't know why we shouldn't take that seriously. Okay, well, I do think we need something else, and the something else we need, I thought for a long time, for various reasons, involves general relativity. Now, the basic thing which started general relativity off was this thing called the principle of equivalence, and Einstein worried about um, relativity in the context of something accelerating rather than not just moving uniformly, and he realized that gravity is the important thing in this, that if you have, say, a big rock and a small rock dropping from the, this is Galileo, probably he never did it, but it's a nice uh, image, Galileo dropping a big rock and a little rock down, and they reach the ground at the same time. And if you imagine a little insect on the big rock looking at the little rock, in that time when it's falling, that insect sees the other rock hovering as though there was no gravity. So you can get rid of gravity, at least locally, by falling freely. And that's what we know now. Astronauts falling freely don't feel the, for the force of the Earth because they're falling freely. And gravity is just that nature that you can get rid of it by falling freely. That's the fundamental principle of Einstein's general relativity. And what's really rather surprising and hardly ever referred to is the fact that that is inconsistent with the fundamental principles of quantum mechanics. Now, I want to give you a sketch of that. I can't go into the details. But this is what I regard as the most powerful reason to believe in the sort of scheme that Stuart Hameroff and I have developed, which we call ORC-OR, but not the ORC part. It's the OR, which means objective reduction of the state. So you see, in standard quantum mechanics, you have these two parts, the state 
solves according to unitary evolution of a Schrodinger equation, and then there's some place where the probabilities come in when you make a measurement. Well, what is a measurement? A measurement is by a device which is still made of the same atoms and molecules and things, everything else. So why doesn't that follow the rules of quantum mechanics? And then it doesn't make a measurement. It just, all the different outcomes comes all that in superposition. So that's, uh, not, that's not too good. Okay, now, I'm not going to tell you the details here because this isn't an appropriate place. But just, uh, just imagine there's an experiment on a tabletop and it's a quantum experiment, and the experimenter wants, wants to take into account the gravitational field, just the Earth's field. Now, there are two ways you might do it. One is the Newtonian way to say, well, gravity is just another force. You put a term in the Hamiltonian and just do what every, everybody else does in quantum mechanics. That's a Newtonian perspective. Or you could take the Einsteinian perspective, which is to say, no, there isn't a force, gravitational force. You just have to fall freely, and then it's gone. So you imagine a frame of reference which falls freely, and now there is no gravitational field, you do the same calculations again, and you find there's only difference between the two procedures is what's called a phase factor. And a phase factor means you've got your, well, here's your state, that's the quantum state, it's a complex thing, I'm not going to go into details here, but the phase factor is multiplying it by a complex number of, of, uh, of modulus unity, e to the i theta, where theta is a real number. And those are not supposed to make any difference. So the two things are equivalent, you could say, because the state you're looking at is only different between the two by this phase factor, and phase factors don't count. So they're equivalent, but they're not. They're not quite, because you have to look carefully at that phase factor. And that phase factor, if you look at it carefully, and not, again, not going into details, you see that it changes from what quantum field theorists call changes from one vacuum to another vacuum. Now, if you stay in what's called one vacuum, you're fine. If you stay in the other vacuum, you're fine. And so this thing doesn't disturb it. It's fine. You could do one or the other. But suppose you had a gravitational field, not the Earth now, but of some body, which itself is in superposition of two locations. Now, this one, you would need one vacuum. And this one, you would need the other vacuum. And one of the rules of quantum field theory is you've got to stick to your vacuum. Not allowed to take one vacuum for part of your calculation and another vacuum for the other one. So it's a cheat. You're stuck. So all I do here is say, OK, I'm stuck, but let's go ahead and just see where the trouble comes. And the trouble is resolved if you say, well, that state, it's, each one is supposed to be stationary. You're, if the lump is over the blue place, that sit, just sits there forever. If it was in the red place, it sits there forever. What about the superposition of the lump being here and here at the same time? That's when you get into the trouble. And the trouble comes from this kind of consideration. And so you, you say, well, one way of resolving that trouble is it spontaneously reduces to one or the other. And if it does that, you can estimate the time scale for it to be one or the other. And that's what we use in the OCOA principle. So it comes from perfectly genuine physical considerations, both of which the quantum side and the general relativity side are accepted theories extraordinarily well tested. I should say that general relativity is now extremely well tested, not just quantum mechanics. I mean, if I, people know that if you have, you have a clock sitting on this table here and the clock sitting somewhere up there, they would run at slightly different rates. But nowadays, it, you could have a clock here and a clock about here, and the difference in those rates can be measured directly. So it's amazing the technology that we have now and general relativity is shown to be an extraordinarily precise theory. Now, but they're in conflict. So you need something like the state reduction. Now that's all kind of theoretical, nothing really to do with consciousness. <clears throat> but it did to me, because when I was trying to think, you know, if you have a physical system which acts in a way which is not algorithmic, <clears throat> it's got to explore some flaw in existing theory. And it seemed to me this flaw is the main place it should be. Now, I, I want to develop that a little more and say, what do you do? Well, what do you do uh, is you take. See, the thing at the top is, is this the right way up or is that the right way up? That's the right way. OK. <laughs> that way? That way. OK, yes, sorry. OK, now if you've got a lump here, this is meant to be the mass distribution here. So it's mostly zero there, There's, and then it, you get a mass, and then it goes down. And this is supposed to be a stationary state. And that's all right in quantum mechanics or relativity. That's not a problem. But suppose it was a superposition of two states, and that's the problem. <clears throat> 
Then you ask for it to try and be stationary, and then you run into the difficulties I've just been mentioning. And what you find is <clears throat> that you take the gravitational field here, thank you, and you look at the difference between, <clears throat> not the gravity, I'm sorry, you look at the mass distribution here and the mass distribution here, and you take the difference between the two, which really takes one, you make one of them negative, if you like. And you take that difference between the two mass distributions, and then you work out what's called the gravitational self-energy of that difference. And that's a thing we call EG. And the reciprocal of EG, or H cross over EG, is the time scale for this thing to become one or the other. And now, if you had a uniform distribution, you'd have a pretty good calculation. But of course, the distribution is not uniform. It's made up out of lots of nuclei or <clears throat> things like that. And so you have to imagine separating it that and then taking the gravitational self-energy of the difference. And then you find it's likely to be infinite if you take these particles as point particles. Well, that's no good. It's too, that's too, good, too bad in the opposite direction. So what you really do is to consider looking at the Schrodinger equation and tell you what, put all the forces you've got into consideration and try to work out what the mass distribution is, or the expectation, expectation value of the mass distribution, and you find it's got a certain spread. And that's what you take. You take that spread, and then you get a finite answer when you separate them, and that should tell you how long that's going to last. So that's the idea. And here I have a sort of space-time picture of the, what's going on. Um, here we have... Oh, thank you. Yes, I need that. Thanks very much. Here we have... The space-time picture of the red one is the lump in one position, and the green one is the lump in the other position. And it starts off, you see, there's the lump. This is space-time. Time is going up the picture. Well, it's going along that way, if you like. So time is going that way, and space is going this way. And this little lump here means that the space-time, the space has got distorted by the presence of the lump. Now, as you evolve this, and now it starts to split into these two in superposition. And the criterion that we have for the state reduction can be phrased in another way. You ask how much space-time separation there is between this green one and the red one, and when that reaches a Planck scale, that's uh, putting the Planck's constant equal to 1 and the gravitational constant equal to 1, and then use units with a 1, and then when this separation becomes of that order, that's when the universe or something has to decide which it is. So that is the condition, the OR condition can be expressed that way. You have a slight deformation of the space-time, and there's another one, and you try to imagine the own superposition. That leads you into trouble. That's the kind of trouble I was talking about before. Two different space-times trying to bring them together and have a description in which they make, it makes, them sen makes sense of them being in superposition. That's where you're having trouble, and it is resolved by one of them being disappearing, and the other one survives. So that is the picture. And the EG here comes in here. The, the tor is the length of time it takes before it separates, and so on. But this is just physics. Okay. Now, you've got five more minutes. Five minutes, thank you. And then you have to talk backward in time. That's all right. I can do it. I can do it in five minutes. Sorry. Exactly. That's what the five minutes are for. <laughs> now, you see, here is where the proto-consciousness comes in. See, consciousness, either it's a decision by a proto-conscious being, which says, no, I'm going to do this and not that. Is there free will of some sort like that? Or it's a random choice, or it's some very sophisticated choice that nature has to make, and it involves some very complicated analysis to decide which it is, which looks random and isn't really random. All those possibilities. But the view here is that is where consciousness comes in. When this separation reaches this limit, that's a, moto, a moment of proto-consciousness. And if this is organized in some meaningful way, which the brain is supposed to be doing, then this becomes an actual moment of consciousness. Now I'm going to get to the thing that, um, well, let me describe this in a slightly different way. How would you set this up? Well, here is, I should say there are experiments looking at this. So far, not a clear yes or no answer. But uh, here's a sort of experiment. They're all of this nature. I've got the wrong one up there. It's this one I want. Here we are. 
but it's looking like a completely stupid experiment. You've got a machine here for pushing this lump here. It isn't doing it yet. And you've got a laser here, and there's a, a single high-energy photon which goes shooting across the top. OK, that's a bit uninteresting. But here, let's put a mirror in it, and that photon now activates this machine, and it pushes the lump. OK. Now, of course, the idea is this is not going to be a mirror, but it's going to be a beam splitter. So it sends, splits the photon into two parts. One part goes this way, the other part activates that, and therefore the lump is pushed into two locations. And that is where the OR comes in, and so on. So all the experiments are much more sophisticated like this than this, I may say, but they're of this general nature. And we don't know, have an, have an answer yet. It would be very important to have one. Now, the thing I was talking about to Stuart last night was it, it started to worry me again because he was telling me about experiments. I mean, it's the old Libet thing where you have a conscious decision is made and somehow some machine tells you, no, no, you made that, that decision was made before you thought you made it. And there are now so many experiments of this nature, and I started to get more worried about it again. And Stuart tells me, no, and I said, oh, it's just backwards referral or something. Well, what does that mean? And they, OK, there are all sorts of strange things in quantum mechanics when you formulate it this way or that way. You can take past and future boundary conditions. Uh, Yaka Haranov has ways of doing this. And you can very, get very strange behavior with a bit unclear when, what happens, and so on. So maybe it's something like that. But what I'm trying to say is it's something so incredibly simple that I don't know why I didn't see this or other people hadn't pointed it out to me before. It's just staring you in the face. In fact, I would say that it's, a, it's, a, it's probably an experimental test of Orc OR to see whether there is this apparent choice made by the world before the conscious person makes the choice. It tends to be used as an argument against free will or against um, any theory which consciousness is actually doing anything. It's just an epiphenomenon. It comes along for the ride. The universe is doing something else, and somehow consciousness comes in at that point. I mean, I've never been able to take that seriously. Why on earth did nature bother to evolve consciousness if it's not doing anything? It went to such a lot of trouble to produce consciousness. Surely it's of some value. And it seems to me, I can't accept that. It's got to be doing something. But here is the is situation. This is a very simplified picture of the OR thing again. Here I put time going this way. Here we have a state of the world. The state splits into the two alternatives that might happen. And here is where the consciousness comes in. And you think you're doing something. Whereas the decision seems to be made back here. But that's completely what one does. Let me, let me say that, let's explain that a little better. You see, what does the world do? Well, it does that. And when is the decision made that it does that rather than that? Well, you might say the decision is made here. But that's not according to, you see, what is it? According to Orko R, here is where consciousness comes in. And here is where the choice between these two alternatives comes in. And this is where the brain or the mind or whatever it is makes a decision to do this rather than do that. Or it may be a passive thing. I'm, just, I'm thinking about the active processes. So it's an active conscious decision to do this rather than do this. And let's suppose it is independent of the physics. The actual choice that is made is really being made somehow by a being who is exerting its consciousness. Now, th that being has now made its decision, and it's, the universe has done this. So this is the history of the universe. Now, where do you think that choice was made? Well, according to the, what the universe actually did, the choice was made back here, way before the conscious experience took place. But that's exactly what you expect in this picture. It's that this other world, somehow, it's like, it's like under, under the uh, Stalinist uh, dictatorship, you know, you have people who were one time supporting the regime and then they become a non-person. They just aren't there anymore and they're rubbed out from the photographs. Well, that's a bit like this here. This alternative is simply a non-alternative. And that's what the world did. The choice that it did that was made later. Sure, that's fine. 
that branch died, and now that branch has become irrelevant to the world. And it looks as though the choice was made here, but it was not. It was made later on by the conscious being, and this now is the evolution that take, take place. And, and the conclusion that people would come to, oh no, the decision must have been made by the universe here, that's not what happened. They were in superposition. No choice was made. These two alternatives were in superposition. And then this one became the real choice. And so its history was as though the choice had been made here. And it seems to me that is something also that one is subject to experimental tests. You could look at these various cases where it seems as though there is a backwards referral, that the choice seems to have been made long before the conscious experience. And therefore, you think that the conscious experience could not have influenced that earlier event. Yes. But this is really exactly how you have to view it in this case. One of these branches died, and so it's become a non-alternative. Like, as I say, like in Stalin, Stalin Miss Russia. Um, and so that's the kind of picture you get. Now, but maybe you see, you could use that time scale. How long was it before here and here in experiments? And compare that maybe with something to do with the movements of material out here. It would require a lot of understanding here, but at least you could get measure this time scale, and I imagine that's something that could be measured in experiments. And that would give you an estimate of how long the uh, orco R took to took place, took to, took, how long it took in order to take place. So let me leave you with that. That was really the idea that was staring me in the face for at least 20 years, and it was the Stuart was mentioning the other examples of this apparent backward, backwards refer, referral, and I began to think, look, this has got to be a deep feature of the system. It can't be, since it seems to be happening all over the place, it's got to be something which is deeply part of the whole scheme. And then I go and look at this again, I think, in our discussions last night, yeah, well, it's pretty obvious. I mean, if, if that branch of the universe wasn't there, it seems to have been removed at this point, where it was really removed when the conscious decision or conscious observation or conscious something seems to see it to be in this location. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, in other words, the decision that you made now to finish your talk <laughs> actually ended the talk already five minutes earlier. No, because the, the e, I'm afraid the EG, the, the E suffix G would have been a tiny, um, I mean, the state reduction would have been a tiny fraction of a second. I don't think it's going to work. So I'm a, it's I'm a nice a, idea. <laughs> I'm exaggerating only a little. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Roger. Very yes. great talk. Uh, we have. <laughs> We have 10 minutes of time for questions, and I would like, first of all, to ask the other two speakers coming up here on the panel. And um, please have a seat. You stay up here too, right? Yeah, sure. Um, I see a lot of people behind the microphones already. I think I'm afraid we can't even work that up but um, we'll try. So, um, first question goes over there. Hello. Hi. My name is Dale. Um, I'm actually very interested in metamathematics, philosophy of mathematics. I'd like to thank all of you. I hope I'm not up here too long. I really, really hope I'm not up here too long. Uh, I did send David Chalmers uh, uh, an abstract for something that uh, there could be philosophical implications, further philosophical implications for metamathematics. Um, uh, Roger Penrose, uh, question. Sorry, there was a question? One question, please. One question. Very good. Um, from your formal uh, education in mathematics, uh, Gödel's work, uh, as most mathematicians may be opposed to what you say that it can be applied to uh, pretty much any algorithmic axiomatic system. Um, of course, with algorithms, how do you respond to their um, criticism 
that it, you know, Gödel's work, it just can't be uh, his incompleteness terms. Of course, I'm just curious your, um, your thoughts on that. And also uh, Hilbert's attempt to axiomatize all physics, which is his sixth problem. And you know, I think I'll stop there. Uh, Thank you for the question. Thank you so much. Roger, this is for you. Do I need a microphone here? How does it work? Oh, oh, oh no, I've got one here. Haven't I? Yeah. Well, of course, this, uh, this argument was brought up endlessly, and I tried to address them all in my book, Shadows of the Mind, where there are all sorts of complaints people had. Unfortunately, there was, I think, a slight error in that, which, which in the early editions I hadn't corrected, but it's corrected in the later editions. When people say most mathematicians, I don't think that's true. Of, you see, what you find is that mathematical logicians there are probably some uh, not really very formal in my descriptions, and they might point out something like that, which, uh, and then you ask them, what do you really think? No, no, I agree with you. <laughs> so it's, it's not as though they disagree. I mean, the trouble, the main trouble you can have with this argument is that you might not know what the algorithm is, and that's, of course, the point. I mean, if you know the algorithm, and you trust the algorithm, then that can't be the answer. That certainly is not what we are. However, we can be acting, so the theory goes, according to an algorithm which we can't know. Now, what, how is it we can't know it? Not because it's too complicated, because these things, you, I had a long thing on the complication in my shadows of the mind. No, it's simply that you don't know it. Now, the thing is, and I'm using a different argument. I did use this in shadows too, but I hadn't emphasized it so much. There's a different argument. If I had decided to give my lecture the way I originally meant to give it and not mention the thing at the end, I would have given you an example of Goodstein's theorem, which is a very remarkable theorem, which is a Gödel theorem of a sort, and you need not just the ordinary kind of uh, induction to prove it, you need what's called transfinite induction. But again, you can use that, and you could put that in a system too if you wanted to. Now, the trouble he here is, and the argument I tend to give, is that how did human beings evolve OK, you c could imagine that primitive creatures could come across ordinary induction as a way of talking about the infinite. But the how they could conceivably have come about things which involve numbers, which are so enormously huge that present-day computers certainly can't get anywhere close to them. And these numbers you can argue about mathematically, and we can understand them, and we can prove things using those things by means which could not have come about by any algorithm that could conceivably be come about by natural selection. So I'd rather divert all these detailed discussions to that argument. That argument is if we are acting algorithmically when we do our mathematics, that is totally inconceivable as a way of coming about through natural selection. I would say that even now, it's not an, 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 a selective advantage to be a mathematician. I rather yeah, suspect yeah, it's I a read the book, yeah. I agree. You wanted to have this all through history into some extraordinary, uh, 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 sophisticated way. And I, what I do believe was favored by natural selection was an understanding, a capacity to understand things, to maybe to stand back and see why you were doing what you were doing. I mean, Gödel's theorem is just like that. You say, well, what was I trying to do? And then you stand back and look at it. And that ability to do that is part of our understanding qualities. And it seems to me clearly that's something which is advantageous, but it's not something which is encapsulated by an algorithm or by a family of algorithms. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. Do you Thank you very CFC? much. Thank you very much, Roger. Next question goes over here. Thank you. Uh, I want to. My, my name is Sky Nelson, and Roger, I, I appreciate the suggestion you made at the end. It's actually the, the field that I've been working on for about 10 years and uh, the, the idea of that uh, method of collapse. So I'm giving a talk today on uh, meaningful history selection, uh, an equation for synchronicity. Yeah. So my question is for actually for the second gentleman, uh, and I'd appreciate if, if we can talk, Roger, about uh, experimental ways of testing. I think that's a great idea. For the second gentleman, you talked about uh, top-down influencing and contextuality in the making of meaning. And I wonder for any of you, do you have a perspective on how synchronicity, how your concepts apply to synchronicity in our daily experience and contextuality of meaning? Does it apply? This is primarily for you, George. And it's the, the question is, how would you make sense of contextuality and synchronicity in daily lives? In daily lives. In daily lives. What is going 
it's going on all the time in daily life. You, um, in, in ordinary speech, if you talk, he said this to me, you're assuming who he is. If you say, um, I, I, I came from over there, you're assuming you know where over there is. So everyday life is all the time uh, contextually based and um, it's just an automatic way which our brain has learned to function. Thanks for the short answer. Um, is, that, is that Burton? Yes, Burton, please. Uh, yeah, this is a question mainly for Professor Penrose. Uh, I like the chess examples. Uh, they were quite interesting. And uh, some time ago, I was thinking about this. I'm a lousy chess player. But it occurred to me that in terms of the Gödel theorems, you have chess as a finite game with finite set of rules, so it's complete but it's also inconsistent because you can prove that white wins and you can prove that white does not win. Uh, and that's the whole interest in the game. So I wonder if you have thoughts about uh, the value of finite but inconsistent systems. Yes. Well, uh, of course, uh, there's limited time to talk about these things. The chess position doesn't really go very deeply into what we can do and what we can't do and so on. It is a finite game, and clearly you can even, in principle, work the game right out from beginning to end and all possibilities, and that's just finite. It's, it's not the way it's done, and it's pretty huge, the numbers you'd have to consider. And that's really why I turn to mathematics, because then you can imme immediately talk about infinite things. And that is where you start to see a real difference between understanding and computation. Well, you see it already. But the example which I didn't show, which was the Goodstein theorem, which needs transfinite induction, but it's, it tells you that two very simple, well, one slightly funny process and another very simple process. The funny one makes the number much huger and the, sm the simple one subtracts one. And what good science theorem tells you is that the little one always work, wins in the end. That is to say, the tortoise, it's the tortoise and the hare, and the tortoise always wins. The subtracting one eventually kills off the other. Now, the thing is, you you could, if you could try it to any number, and it, the theorem tells you for any number, this always goes, goes down to zero, eventually. But then if you try it for simple numbers, you try it for three, it comes down pretty rapidly, very rapidly. Then you try it to four, and it takes more steps than there are particles in the universe, the observable universe, and so even with four. And that's a finite thing. Four is a finite number, and the steps you go through, finite operation, and you can see it's finite but you could never go through it with a computer and actually follow those steps. You could use your understanding to see what it, what it would do ultimately, but just to do it isn't gonna give you any way. You, you never... So I'm saying that, that, yes, you can say a lot about finite things when the numbers get so huge, they might, well, they might as well be infinite as far as computers are concerned. That is true, you can talk in that finite context all the time. It's a little easier when you talk about the infinite, surprisingly enough, because the infinite is easier to talk about than some absolutely huge ordinary natural number. But yes, I mean, the answer is uh, you can do it with finite things, yes. I had a question to you, Anurban. Uh, the notion of the time crystal sounds, you know, at, f at least at first glance, it sounds a little exotic because nobody has heard about it except the experts. Now, um, what would you say is a good way to connect that to what people in, let's say, complex systems thinking uh, do anyway. So something like, you know, we all know that the brain is a multi-scale dynamical system, and it seems to me that, you know, a good way to um, explain the time crystal from that perspective would be that you are working on a very compact and very sophisticated geometrical representation of a multi-scale dynamical system operating on many time scales. Is that right? Yes, to some extent, uh, that is right. So basically, um, uh, it 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 gives you the um, it gives you the technology. It enables you with a tool that um, you deal with one time scale. But at the same time, there are many other time scales which are operating. But you do not get into the system and determine their. Um, they are materialistic property, but the geometric property 
and that is enough. So for me, um, uh, the interesting part is always, because we come from material science institute where brain is a material and everything is, there is nothing beyond. It's a dead material and nothing, no, uh, we can't say anything, anything else. So, uh, so material properties becomes irre irrelevant totally and symmetry of the system or geometric properties uh, dominating, it's itself a, a very exciting thing for me. And I think that for everybody, for an example, uh, if I say this table, and this table's this circular symmetry and the stick, uh, this uh, linear symmetry, these two are uh, relevant. And what are the material it's made of and all other properties disappear completely. That's the beauty. For an example, we have um, 10 to the power 15 number of microtubules in the brain, but I can take only 128 <laughs> clocks and I can explain. So number of materials doesn't matter. Number of bits doesn't matter. Yeah. What matters is their symmetries and, and you can map it physically with experimentally. So it's a beautiful observation, beautiful way of looking into it. Thank you very much. Now, um, I am afraid that we are out of time right now and I want to apologize for all those who are lining up. Um, I would recommend we go into the break now and everybody who has questions to the speakers, just chase them in the break. <laughs> so have a good break and be back at 11.10. Thank you very much. <laughs>